Welcome, lovely to have you here with us on this beautiful spring day here in New South Wales, Australia. We are continuing with our series on growing up in faith, a journey through Hebrews chapter 11. Last week we spoke on this lovely verse, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3a, which said to us, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. And that was quite significant because it uh, underscored and just highlighted the importance of the creation story. And, and through that, we went through a lovely uh, Greek study, uh, studying some really uh, powerful Greek words that really meant so much more than what the, uh, the English words uh, tried to convey. And, and that word, understand, by faith we understand, it meant to be of, of a thinking uh, rational, you know, of applying mental effort and not just, you know, by chance or random uh, wishy-washy luck or anything like that, but it was a value judgment that gave us the sense of, you know, the worlds were framed by a process, a thought process and leaning towards an intelligent being, i.e. God. The other word that we looked at was the word worlds. And that's quite interesting because the Greek word aeon spoke about this dispensation being part of another one to come. And that's where we look at, you know, God taking us from glory to glory to know that when we close our eyes here, we will open it to be in the presence of our creator. Uh, the other lovely word, and this got some really good, uh, interesting feedback in our midweek uh, Bible study, the word katatizo. It's such a powerful word because, uh, you know, incidentally, the word katatizo was a word that was used to describe the mending and the repairing of uh, fishermen's nets. And uh, it was a lot more in the context of uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3a, because katatizo meant preparing, completing, uh, creating and fitting together and arranging and bringing into order. Because this is what God did when he framed the world. He brought it into your order from out of himself. He spoke it into being. And that's the created order that we find uh, the word of God bringing in. And, and we can look at that and, and we see as well that when God spoke it, when the word of God brought the worlds into being, and it was a, a rhema word. That's the Greek, which means a spoken word that God is able to create, that God is able to speak creation, order, from himself and and that tells us that you know true faith is always based on the word of god and that highlights and uh, again underscores as i said uh, genesis chapter 1 verse 1 that in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth and it takes faith to believe that god created everything because that's what hebrews eleven three says that by faith we understand and and that's what faith does faith points us to a creator faith points us to a higher being, a superior being. And, and it's not just a blind faith, because like we said that, you know, there's, there's plenty of evidence. Albert Einstein, in looking at the created order of the world, in looking at everything around us, I mean, the great scientist that he was, found compelling evidence for creation by design, purpose, and order. And I, Albert Einstein said that, I cannot believe that God plays dice with the cosmos. So on that, you know, we are at the precipice now of going into Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3b. And I've got my daughter Zipporah here with me. And Zipporah is going to come for us and she's going to read our verse for today. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3b. So that the things which are seen were not made of the things which are visible. Hebrews 11, 3b. All right, so uh, in that, uh, clearly, you know, we, we've covered this aspect uh, before in terms of faith being the evidence of things not seen. And, and again, you know, the writer of Hebrews is reminding us that the things which are seen, what we see around us, creation and everything that we have is made by that which is not seen, that which is not visible. Now, last week I spoke about another brilliant scientist Sir Isaac Newton and Sir Isaac Newton made this powerful observation he says that you know when I look at the solar system I see the earth at the right distance from the sun to receive proper amounts of heat and light 
This did not happen by chance, but from an intelligent being, God. And that's what, you know, when you look at it and, and creation shows us this, shows us that we are not being created by some chance or anything like that. Because when you really look at it, if these distances, the distance from the sun to the earth were any different, even by small amounts, it would not result in life. And that cannot be chance or coincidence. That is evidence of an intelligent designer, God. The other thing we need to know is that by these distances being so precise and calculated, it helps us, it, it creates and it establishes a stable water cycle. What do I mean by that? If the sun was any further or any closer to the earth, it would result in catastrophe because if the sun was closer to the earth, it would mean that the waters would boil. And if the sun was further away, it would result in the water freezing up. So this is not chance. This is not at all anything by randomness or anything like that. It is purpose. It is design. Then you look at things like gravity, the axial tilt of the earth, the rotation of the earth, the time frequency, the period of the rotation, and the magnetic field. These all speak to equilibrium. They speak to precise amounts, descriptions, uh, measurements, and this is not just something that has evolved and taken place over billions and billions of years to try and get it right. This is by design, by God speaking into being and creating. And another uh, well-known, uh, what would I say, uh, philosopher and someone that is also inclined towards uh, space and to science, a guy named Stanley Jackie. He said the similar thing that Isaac Newton made. He said that it has supreme coherence from the very small to the very large. It is a consistent unity, free of paradoxes, beautifully proportioned and in the perfect interaction. Now, Stanley Jackie said this in observing creation, in observing you know, the planets and in observing the way that uh, they, they were all equally proportioned, the sun to the earth. And he says, even from the small to the very large, it is a consistent unity, free of paradoxes. There's no contradictions in that there. It is consistent. And I love that. Beautifully proportioned and in perfect interaction. And that, how, that is how God has created. That is the katatidzo. The katatidzo speaks about that order, speaks about that creation. And, you know, this is something that we find that not only are the scientists and the mathematicians able to deduce that and see that, but even, even philosophers like Plato, in looking at the order of the universe and looking at how things were aligned, you know, Plato said this here. He said, from the order of the motion of the stars and of all things under the dominion of the mind, which ordered the universe. You know, Plato observed that, that there was an intelligent designer there was a mind, there was a superior being that was behind all of this. And this should reassure us. Why, why is this important? Well, it should reassure us that our being and everything around us, you know, as Hebrews 11, 3, he says that the things which are visible were created from those, from that which is not visible, not seen. And it reminds us and it drives home the point that chance has no real basis for producing anything. Your existence is tied into this as well. That God has fearfully and wonderfully made you in his image and in his likeness. And we'll see that as we progress through. But also to know that time plus matter plus chance producing intelligence is mythological. It is not possible. And that's what you know, evolution would want you to believe. That's what, you know, not even an evolution, people try to think that is science. That is not proper science. Because proper science attests to what God has created, the order. And this is not something that, you know, we try to make up and stuff like that. I mean, scientists like Albert Einstein, Sir Isaac Newton, make their observations. People that we regard as intelligent, people like Plato, philosophers also come to that same conclusion. So things don't just come by chance. I mean, even an atheist, someone that is opposed to the existence of God, God, Richard Dawkins, he even said something similar. And he says that the ob obvious alternative to chance is an intelligent designer. Arriving at that place where he realizes 
that this cannot have occurred by chance leads Richard Dawkins to make the conclusion that it is by an intelligent designer, i.e. God. And when we look at what we spoke about last week, where Paul in Romans chapter 1 verse 20 uh, highlights that since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. What is Paul saying to us? Paul is saying to us that even people that may not have uh, experienced God, you know, in a, in, a, in a Damascus Road experience or people that may have said, oh, we don't, we haven't heard of God. It is without excuse. Because when you look at the created order, when you look around you and you see the beauty and the splendor, you know, we, uh, we, we, we sang this lovely song in our worship and, and the song speaks about indescribable. Chris Tomlin is, is the songwriter. Indescribable, unimaginable. This is the God. When you look at the beauty around you, creation, when you look at everything that God has created, it is indescribable. But you are without excuse, says Paul, when you want to believe that God does not exist. Because when you look at it, this is what it is, Hebrews 11.3 is highlighting. So that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. So you cannot look at it and, and, and deduce that from what we see, it has been created. Because that's what evolution wants to teach you. Evolution wants to teach you that from, from this came that and that came that. But we know that it is the unseen God that has put things into motion by his spoken word. And when you look at it, when you analyze the order and complexity of creation, creation shows God created a world of order and harmony. Kata tizo. Kata tizo. That's what God did. He framed. He put together. He fashioned. Psalms 139 verses 13 says, He wove us. He knit us together while we were in our mother's womb. And I'm going to unpack the significance of that, knowing that we were created, that we're not just some random act of chance or anything like that. Because this is all only possible by an intelligent being, i.e. God. Now, this is, this is going to blow your mind to know this year that modern science and space exploration have now only recently caught up to what the Bible has already said. Now, people think that the Bible is some book of fairy tales and is not scientific at all or anything like that. But that's the un, uninformed person. That's the person that is not being led by the Holy Spirit. Because when you open up the Bible and you begin to read the Bible, you see that the Bible is not against science, proper science. The Bible is not opposed to that. But the Bible and science are in harmony when truth is allowed to prevail. What am I saying? I'm saying this year that it's only recently through the inventions of, of telescopes and powerful uh, you know, equipment that people have been able to deduce that the earth is a sphere, that the earth floats in space, that the universe is expanding and that individual stars are unique. Things like that have only been recently discovered because of the advance of, of scientific technology around telescopes and things like that there. And even recently being able to piece together and realize that the human body and the earth share common building blocks. But you know what? What if I had to tell you that the Bible over 2000 years ago already spoke this and already revealed this? Would you believe me? Well, take a look for yourself. The earth is a sphere. Isaiah 40, 22. You can go and check it out. It says that. The second point, the earth floats in space. Job 26, 7. Now, Job 26, 7 is one of the oldest books in the Bible. And that was revealed to Job. The universe is expanding. Now, you've got to have a really complicated, sophisticated mechanism in order to deduce that or to arrive at that conclusion. But Isaiah, the prophet, revealed that. Isaiah 42, verse 5. Individual stars are unique. I mean, that takes intense and, and, and real sophisticated study to be able to, uh, to, to arrive at that conclusion. But Paul said it, 1 Corinthians 15, 41. The earth and the human body share common building blocks. That's in, that's in Genesis, right at the beginning. So when we come to study and to know this Bible, we know that it is an intimate 
message by an intelligent God who has designed us and created us for a plan and a purpose. It is not by some random act. And the Bible is not mythology. The Bible is truth. The Bible is real. The Bible confirms all what God has purpose for in our lives. So what significance is that? What does it all come down to? What does it boil down to? Well, pretty much that God is the source of all life. And that's what Genesis 1, 1 is, is telling us. That in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3 tells us that. That by faith, we understand that the words were framed by the word of God. Because when you don't understand that there, you miss out on the, on the fact that God has created everything. The plants, the animals, in the very beginning in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve. And life begets life. That's the universal principle. That's the principle that the Bible teaches us. That life begets life. That the universe is composed of building blocks, as we've shared earlier, energy, matter, space, and time. However, each of these components is inherently lifeless. Energy, matter, space, and time are lifeless. Living things could not have emerged from lifeless elements. That's what evolution wants you to believe. However, non-life cannot produce life. Only life produces new life. And this is why I've headed up this slide that God is the source of all life. And by faith, Hebrews 11 is emphasizing that. That this is our underpinning. This is our foundation. That God is a living being. Not an abstract concept or an impersonal force. He has been alive forever. He is the logical source of all life. And that, brothers and sisters, we can take to the bank. Now, where does this all come down to? How does it permeate into life? Well, very importantly, the origin of life has important implications. If you believe or if you don't believe in God, the creator, it has huge implications. Well, let's start with number one. If you believe that God is the source of all life, then you are going to realize that he created us for a purpose. And that is significant, quite significant. Because when you know that you were created for a purpose, that you have a, a desire, divine destiny, then you are significant and you have value. Because the God of the universe, the God has created all of these galaxies, the planets, the stars, the sun, the moon. He created you. And that's what the story of Genesis tells us. That this God came down and he breathed life into Adam. The very breath of God is within us. And that tells us, therefore, life, our lives, all life is precious and worthy of preservation. And this is why you find that us as Christians, we are so against abortion. We are so against euthanasia. Because all life is precious. Because when you understand that, when you understand that God is the source of all life, you realize who are we to interfere with that? Who are we to take lives? Life is precious. And in the womb, science, false science today wants to tell you that that, that is a fetus there's not really much human or hum, human likeness in it but God tells us in his word that he has fashioned us he has knitted us even in our mother's womb and that's the message the prophet Isaiah, Jeremiah was, was told God said to him I formed you in your mother's womb and that's where we value life and the message by faith we know that now the alternative if we look at us as being uh, products of random chance then we enter the world without purpose. And we find that we have no objective value and significance. So what does that tell you? Life has no value. I am insignificant. And, and it seems and it is deemed as worthless and disposable. That's what that premise does. Products of random chance. Evolution promotes that. Promotes that we are just here some random being on this universe. Wherever. But God is so much more than that. And that's where God gives us purpose. Because when you believe that you are an act of random chance, then there's no purpose. There's no value. 
there's no significance and you deem your life as worthless. Now that is linked in to the problem that we have in the world today. The despair, the distress, the depression, the self-harm. Because when you are led to believe that you are insignificant, that you are just here by some random act of chance, then you're going to turn to self-harm. You're going to hurt yourself. You're even going to think about looking at what's the purpose. I don't need to be here. Because you see your life as not having value. But the God of the universe, this indescribable God, came down and he died for you. He paid the price for you. And in his word, he highlights and he shows us that all of creation has come into being through his word. And that's where you are valuable, that you are loved. God has a purpose and a plan for each and every one of us. And your life is precious when you believe that this God created you in his image, in his likeness. He created him, male and female. You are not an act of chance. You may have been in this world. I don't know. Maybe you don't know uh, your parents or whatever the situation is. Know that God loves you. God cares for you. And this is what all of creation cries out and highlights. That God has a plan and a purpose for you. You know, we, uh, we sing this lovely hymn. How great thou art. And when you look at it and, and the hymn writer looks at creation. He looks all around. And then he says, then sings my soul. My Savior God, how great thou art. I want to leave you on that note to let you know, number one, that God created you in his image and in his likeness. Imago Dei, the value that God has placed in you is, is, is significant. It is worth the while to know how great God is. That he created you in his image and in his likeness. And life is worth the living because of that fact. So I'm Mayan Subrayan. And I want to thank you for sending in your prayer requests. Please keep them coming in. And we want to pray for you. And uh, hopefully you'll join us again next week. But allow me to pray as I conclude. Father, I thank you for each and every one that's listening to this message. Lord, whatever thoughts of despair, distress and maybe even depression that they are going through, Lord, that you would uh, remove that with the thought of knowing that they have been fearfully and wonderfully made, created in your image, in your likeness, God, to know that you have purpose for them, that you have a plan for them, that your plans are to give them a hope and a future. Thank you for creation. Thank you for everything around us. Holy Spirit, I pray that when we look into creation, that we would see your hand, that we would see an intelligent designer behind everything that we have around us, that it is not by chance, it is not by luck, it is not by any randomness, but it is by purpose and design. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Take care. Till next week.